whether we're dealing with severely traumatized clients or anyone who has self-esteem problems, it's helpful to contextualize the critical voice begins as a protector part. It's seeking to catch us screwing up and let us know so we can autocorrect before someone in the outside world sees us and corrects us or punishes us or worse yet, humiliates in us. In this video, I'm talking with Reg Moore Robinson and Bill Brislin about this book, EMDR and Dissociation, The Progressive Approach. In this conversation, Reg and Bill explain what is the progressive approach and how to work with parts, specifically with the inner critics. We are talking about how to target dysfunctional self-care patterns and how to work with dissociative phobias. There is a lot of good content in this conversation, including two demos. Now, this conversation is just a little preview into a 10-month program that Reg and Bill have in which they teach the content of this book and how to work with complex trauma and clients who experience dissociation. This program is for trained EMDR therapists. And if you want to learn more about this program, check out the links below this video. Here's a conversation with Reg Mara Robinson and Bill Brislin. So, Reg Mara Robinson and Bill Brislin, welcome to the Art and Science of EMDR. And thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. And what an amazing group of people studying EMDR on a Friday afternoon. I yes. know. And thank you for spending your Friday afternoon with us. And we've been learning actually all month. And we've been spending time reading this book, EMDR and Dissociation, The Progressive Approach. And so I wanted to start by asking, what is The Progressive Approach? The progressive approach is a methodology for treatment for clients who've experienced chronic and um, uh, traumatic uh, neglect and traumatization over much of their lifespan. And so these extremely difficult clinical presentations need a different approach from the standard protocol. The standard protocol we're taught, go for the golden snitch, which is a touchstone memory, do the biggest trauma as soon as possible. And with the progressive approach, we're gonna gently, gently circle, gradually processing dysfunctional elements that might be stored in the memory networks. And we're gonna gently get to the core traumatic material. So I noticed, Bill, that you did this um, so it's, it's not as linear as I understand it as the, the standard EMDR protocol that we have eight phases and we kind of like go through the eight phases very linearly. Uh, the progressive approach is more something like that. I think that's a great observation. And there are six higher order mental processes that are being mentioned. Um, mentalization, mindfulness, which I'm assuming most people listening to this talk are uh, familiar with, uh, meta processes, differentiation, synthesis, and realization. I'm wondering if you can talk about some of them and what are they and why, how do we use them? I'd be happy to talk about them, but they're actually very critical to build before you go into processing the trauma. Without being able to do these things, it's difficult to get the shifts in phase four, five, and six that you're after. So we actually begin working on this material from the very beginning. This is where self-capacity begins to grow. So a client needs to recognize when we talk about Mindfulness is not just being here and now and noticing my thoughts and my emotions and my body sensation, but it's also seeing you and the other person at the same time and being able to be with both. Differentiation is things like, this is my story, but that's your story. This is um, my emotion and that's your emotion. 
um, personalization or personification is this is my story. And many times clients come in struggling to believe that their story is their story. And over time, you see they grow in capacity to own it. Presentification is about here and now, noting I'm here and now. And you know, when somebody's in trauma time, they're feeling back then and there. And being able to keep one foot here and one foot there, we're familiar as dual awareness. But for clients with a lot of dissociation, it is very difficult to do that. So over time, they become more aware of it. Part of one of the important things about this chapter that's so important is as you're fostering the mental capacity, you're fostering the client's ability to be more and more self-empowered, which is our goal. So it's highly critical. The more they build these skills, the less reliant on you they're going to be. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice things like the book talks about A and P, the apparently normal part, and it talks about the EP. But the big difference here with this book is the most adult self. And we are working through the adult self, not through an emotional part, not through an adult part but we're also always speaking to the adult part, the most adult self, and inviting the other parts to speak through the adult self. That's the end game. Early, you can't always do that, but that's part of what we're going through. And if you miss that part and spend too much time working directly with parts, you're actually reinforcing the splintering of the system from these authors' perspectives. So we're looking for our clients to be able to do all these processes, the mentalization, the personification, all of these. And when we're noticing that maybe there's a piece missing, how is it that we can approach the, the learning of that, the psychoed of that, the enhancing that skill? Wow. Well, part of that's what we're about to be talking about when we move into some of the other chapters, we're going to give a demonstration of one of those mm -hmm. techniques. But yeah. we're just putting it on the table. This is what the concept is in language that they can um, understand. And when we notice it happening in session, highlight it. Yeah. Make what to do about it and encourage them to talk about moments of it outside of session. Mm -hmm. um, just make it part of the everyday normal language like the colors in the room, the temperature, uh, mm -hmm. avoiding the concepts and not talking about them disempowers, but just normalizing it is a big same with dissociation, normalizing it. I want to go back to the concept of adult self, the most adult self in the ANP. And I think there's a little confusion there, uh, especially because we have different approaches. So first there was you know, ego state therapy, and then came IFS and kind of rebranded some of the concepts. So what is, Reg, what is the difference between the ANP, the apparently, apparently normal part, and the most adult self? A big difference. And I'm glad you're asking about the clarification. So the apparently normal part is what's functioning in the world today without a comfort level and a knowledge of the story and the trauma and the history. They want to be right like uh, the person that goes to work, the person that raises the kids, the person that gardens. They don't want to have connection with their history and their story. And when the triggers happen, they're annoyed at the parts of trauma that come forward. They don't play well mm -hmm. together. So when we're working with the most adult self, the most adult self, builds relationships with all of the A and P's and all of the EP's. They become like the baseball team coach and manager, which we're going to get into over time. It's mm -hmm. that's who you're strengthening. That's who you're working to build and grow the most adult self. Mm -hmm. That is an interesting analogy. I'm wondering if you can talk a little more about the baseball team and what, what, okay. what does it represent? Well, you know, when you're working with a team, a baseball team, it has a lot of different players and they all have different roles. 
They have different needs. They have positions on the team. And they begin when they're little kids, you know, just playing t-ball in the backyard and learning how to grow and be team members. But imagine a team that doesn't talk with one another, that doesn't understand each other's needs, doesn't understand each other's roles. And that's what somebody walks in the door in early treatment. They're a team that doesn't know how to play together or talk together. So Mm -hmm. we're working towards getting all of the team members aware of each other, communicating with each other, having compassion and cheering each other on, understanding Mm -hmm. the team strategy. When things go wrong, it's not about beating up the person who missed the catch. It's about what do you need and what did you learn and how can you do a better job catching it next time? How can we help you catch it next time? And the manager is kind of aware what kind of state is, what kind of day, what kind of weather is it that this team is going to be playing in? Is how do I prepare them for it? So there's a lots of uh, flow from the high hierarchy down and from the very basic player all the way up and all the way through fostering that quality. So they know each other without even having to barely talk. The signals are easily read. Mm -hmm. I could talk about that till the cows come home too. (laughs) (laughs) This is a very dense book and there, there's a lot. And I just want to mention that uh, Reg, you and Bill are teaching, you you have a consultation group that you teach this book and the content and how to work with it over a 10 month period, uh, which Christine was part of this uh, program. That's Mm -hmm. why I invited her to join us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really a wonderful learning opportunity because not only is this book dense, but beginning to work with this, this kind of condition is extraordinarily isolating for a therapist and overwhelming. And so what's beautiful about having Raj and Bill and being in the 10 month program and then really picking this book apart is um, you come out feeling not so alone and you come out with a lot of resources and um, you come out a lot better equipped because I, I'm going to say, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to say a lot of People, a lot of times, therapists, almost all the time, a therapist has somebody walk in their office with some level of this disorder or condition. And um, if they even see it in the first place, they don't know what to do with it. And so, um, yeah, I would highly recommend it. <laughs> the book and the program. Yeah. So I wanted, I wanted to go back to the EPs and the uh, a and P is also known as parts. And, you know, we, I think the, the most, um, dominant for many clients, the most dominant part is the inner, what we call the inner critic. We have different names for it, but, um, we see a lot of self judgment that clients have, and sometimes it's about the content. So, you know, I'm not good enough or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm there's something wrong with me. And sometimes it's about the, so sometimes it's about the content and sometimes it's about the process of EMDR itself. I'm not doing it right. And I'm getting it a lot with my clients. I'm not doing it right. Why does it happen? And what do you, uh, what do you think that we should, we can do about it? Oh, Bill, would you like to go? I've been doing so much talking. I would love to. World-class hypnotherapist, by the way, and he blends this. This is wonderful. I think whether we're dealing with severely traumatized clients or anyone who has self-esteem problems, it's helpful to contextualize the critical voice begins as a protector part. It's seeking to catch us screwing up and let us know so we can autocorrect before someone in the outside world sees us and corrects us or punishes us or worse yet humiliates us so very often whether this is an ego state or whether it's a dissociated part with the first person perspective and amnesic barriers that the critical voice tends to get 
really, really good at its job and it goes rogue and it loses its initial function or purpose of protecting and it gets kind of mean. So the the pathway with that is giving that voice an attaboy or an girl for its original intention rather than shaming it, trying to exile it, uh, to to eradicate it. And then we try to find a new job description for that voice, that part, whatever it is. But that, that's a very simplistic response to a very complex question, but it can happen in the most subtle ways with everybody who all has our little dings of our self-esteem that um, where we can feel unsure of ourselves up to people who uh, are extremely dissociative and have individuated self-states. What yeah. would be an example of, um, an, if you said we, we give the part, the, the critic part, a new job, what would be an example of that? What would that look like? Well, if the um, opportunity, if the, the person it's currently their job is to scream and yell and make me freeze and cringe. A new job could be to flash a warning when something isn't going right and help me get information that's going to help things go better. Mm -hmm. What do I need to do? What do I need to remember? What can I learn? What resources can be drawn in? This could be a resource provider rather than a uh, scolder. Right, so just calling attention to that part, firstly, right, which is a big step in of itself, to be able to see it, talk to it, honor it, right, because sometimes clients, without shaming it, right, honor it for its intentions, and being grateful for it, and all of that is a tremendous step, and I want to say that, like, Sometimes that could take years, just that little piece, right? Maybe that's a good segue into the next chapter on self-care. Mm -hmm. Self-care, it's, it's an initial intervention. So from EMDR language, we think of phase two, not that phase two only happens at the beginning of therapy, but it overlays preparation, overlays through all of therapy, but in self-care is the foundation of stabilization. There is no stabilization without good self-care. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the chapter, you know, this was chapter six, introducing healthy patterns of self-care. Mm -hmm. um, again, we're presuming those templates don't necessarily exist, um, pre-exist, and that sometimes we're creating it from scratch, it's again, to underscore, it's really important that we're seeking to develop a collaborative relationship with the client, not a caretaking role. If we try to reparent the client and do everything for them that didn't happen developmentally, uh, they become dependent on us. The adults or older children don't learn the way infants did and we will burn out. Mm -hmm. So we have to find ways of nurturing. And the chapter is full of ideas. For those of you who have familiarity already with Jim Knipe's loving eyes procedure, that's alluded to and modified in the chapter. It may not have been enough for you to fully grasp it, but you can get that in all kinds of places, EMDR toolbox. There's lots of ways you can enhance your knowledge. Or there, you know, there were four authors for this chapter and they were all trying to get their thing in. So you got a lot of stuff, but you didn't get anything in a lot of depth in the chapter. Like you may know a little bit about Andrew Leeds positive affect tolerance, and this chapter might help you apply it with um, your more dissociative cases. But if you didn't know anything about it, you probably didn't get enough out of this chapter <laughs> to apply it. So let me suggest just that um, a couple things that can help. They allude to the self-care scale that they um, 
uh, that they kind of break apart throughout the chapter, but they didn't give it to you anywhere succinctly. And it's a good way to assess. I put it into chat and Radham will give it, make it available to you for after, but it's a very simple scale for assessing where clients are. And it'll give you so much information about where you should be in therapy. So I really want to recommend that to you. And towards the end of the chapter, they um, one of the sections that I think is in your tool belt pretty much already as competent EMDR therapists is the whole idea of um, in your treatment plan, including memories uh, of dysfunctional self-care patterns. And mm -hmm. the second PDF I gave you, it expands that little section in the chapter, but it's still pretty simple, pretty succinct, but it's linear, which many of you will like. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it gives you a method for targeting dysfunctional self-care patterns, still being careful to avoid the core trauma, which we're not ready to go anywhere near at this point in treatment. So I, I hope those things are helpful to you, especially if you felt overwhelmed by this chapter. I think this is a little something that you'll be able to sink your teeth into right away and run with it. Thank you, Bill. I, I think this is an extremely important topic that, um, you know, I think everybody knows that self-care is important and everybody knows that we need to exercise and we need to meditate and we need to do all these things. But how do we translate this knowledge into action? And that's what I think a lot of us are struggling to um, have our clients do it on a consistent basis, because I think that it's the consistent, the consistency that uh, generates the, the outcomes, the results of these practices. Well, and self care is more about than just, okay, I go jogging or I, but it's also about the care of the inner system, mm -hmm. which is think of it from the theory of structural dissociation. By definition, A and P's are phobic of EPs and all the traumatic material they contain. So I had a, Christine knows the story. I think I had a client a couple of years ago who we were like literally walking to the car at the end of the day. It's the end of the week. I was over it. And, um, I'm getting in my car and across the parking lot, she screams, what should I give up for Lent? And I thought, oh no, if I say the wrong thing, this is going to be like six weeks of repair between us. And I said, well, why don't you give up being mean to, I'll call her Susie, a child part of hers that she likes to lock in the basement and burn with cigarettes and things. And, um, of course, all kinds of expletives came out that I can't repeat to you on this platform when I said that. But then the next week in session, um, I said, well, how's Lent going? And she said, well, we're not playing in the sandbox together, but we're sitting there not hurting each other. Next uh, <laughs> okay, that. But it was really a turning point in therapy for her. And it was just a throwaway intervention I did in the parking lot, which I'm not really recommending this to anybody. Is the yeah. best try to home people? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but it was addressing what we'll talk about two chapters from now about the phobia of dissociative mm -hmm. parts, and we have to address this before we can even think about getting to integrating and digesting the traumatic material, because mm -hmm. we have all this stuff that's maintaining dissociative processes, which is going to keep things from being fully integrated and digested from that perspective of the adult self that Reg was talking about. Mm -hmm. I get really excited when I keep talking. You have to kind of cut me off periodically. <laughs> Something we share. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that um, I found interesting is that the caretaking approach that many therapists take versus the collaborative approach. I'm, I'm wondering if you, uh, one of you can talk about the differences and what, what's, what is recommended and how do we do that? In a collaborative approach, we're not touting ourselves as being the expert 
we might know a lot about treating trauma and complex trauma and a lot about attachment repair, but the client is the expert in them. And we want to try to have a beginner's mind mm -hmm. regarding the client center experience. And we model by being curious about their inner experience, we try to model for them curiosity about their experience. We um, try to create attachment repair interweaves activities that they can do with themselves rather than us doing for them. I'm not going to talk to you on the phone in crisis and rock you to sleep on the phone and sing to you, but I'm going to see if there's a part of you that's capable of coming forward and providing some comfort. If there isn't, then I'm going to try to strengthen and nurture a part of you to do that. But once I start doing that, I'm stuck and in secular, yeah. secular orbit is never going to end. Mm -hmm. And that's why um, I, if we can maybe talk a little bit, I don't know if the timing's right about like talking through. Is that an appropriate time to like when we're talking about the most adult self taking care of the baseball team, managing the baseball team and maintaining that co-consciousness of um, really the whole system being aware of what's going on which is really a great goal. And so um, just in what you're saying, Bill, being able to talk talk to the most adult self, to talk through to the system. It's in the demo uh, we would like to show. Oh, okay, good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the next chapter that we're moving into, chapter seven, working towards integration, which basically means you know increasing integrative capacity, not parts going away, but co-consciousness is so important and one of the activities you can do in helping like with my part just getting them to sit in the sandbox together without hurting each other the uh chapter talks about inviting two parts to share a neutral stimulus the example they give in the book is like a sunrise or something like that and so we did we pulled another thing that you can actually do in session and we tried to model that for you Okay, so Bill and I just made this earlier today, uh, thinking about what we're going to be talking about. And here we go. I was in my tropical phase. <laughs> this demo is experiencing neutral stimuli in the external world together. Oh, Reg, um, can you check in and see if you can access your most adult self and see if that part of you feels like doing an activity where you can experience something with your seven-year-old part, if that would be okay. It would be okay. Nice. Okay. And then let's uh, see if you can access the part of you that feels seven. And if it would also be okay with that part of you to participate in this experiment. Yeah. yeah, nice. And I think I noticed you have some altoids there. Could we use an altoid as the thing that both of you can experience? Curiously strong. They are. So let's uh, let's go with that curiosity. <laughs> and uh, so just go ahead and take one out and hold it in your hand, and just notice what it's like for your adult self, and also for the part of you that feels seven to simply. Look at it, noticing the scent, the feel, the texture, the color. What are you noticing? It's hard, tiny. It should have a little face on it. It's missing a face. It's between my two fingers. 
It's a little scratchy on the bottom. Well, I've had them for a long time. Mm. And does both your adult self and the part of you that feels seven still feel like you're experiencing it together, each in your own way? <laughs> yeah, I think it's my adult self that knows he's been in my desk a long time. Yeah, but it's my seven-year-old self that uh, thinks there should be a little face on it. <laughs> nice. Well, would it be okay to just place it in the mouth and notice what it's like from both the perspective of the adult self and the part that feels seven? It should be easy to do that. Okay. Just try it, and then when you're ready, let me know what that's like. Mm -hmm. It's empty. Mm -hmm. The mouth is uh, turning into a myth. Wow. And then maybe... Back of my tongue wow. and feel it the most. And is there any consensus between your adult self and your child self of whether you'd like to let it just rest and melt away in your mouth or you'd like to chunk into it? Mm. My little seven year old just wants to crunch away. But my adult self wants to just let it dissolve slowly and enjoy it over a long period of time. Maybe. So just notice how both of those can exist simultaneously in you. Yeah. I'm going to tell my teeth not to crunch down on it um, at the same time. My... Uh, Seven-year-old is really curious about how, as I move it around, different parts of my mouth are feeling it, you know. Nice. Enjoying the well, taste. That's wonderful that you're able to notice all of those things together from those different perspectives. So good job. Thank you. Yeah. It's getting littler. If I don't hurry up, I can't crunch. Oh, what feels like the right thing to do? Is that okay with your adult self if you crunch now? Well, I, I you know, my seven-year-old wants to have some fun with the mint, and yes, I should have some fun. Cool. I'm crunching. Wow. Just How is that? Lots of little pieces in my mouth. How's that feeling for both perspectives? Mm. It's, it feels nice to be seen by each other. Like, like I know that she wanted to play and crunch away. And yet my seven-year-old self was just kind of Knowing to be patient while my most adult self was enjoying the lingering experiences of the mint. Nice. Yeah. And we kind of both got what we needed. Beautiful. I'm glad you did. Yeah. 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 And that's our demonstration of experiencing the neutral stimulus you know what stood out to me is uh bill when you you ask um reg if about the consensus between the adult self and, and the part um which kind of took me to think about chapter seven 
the word I think that the most pronounced word is integration. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about integration in, in that context. Mm. Well, um, if you'll notice, Bill gave me lots of time to check in with both my adult, most adult and the child. I got to draw forward what that was like. He didn't direct me. And integration is being, it's not where everything mushes together and there's only one. It's a relationship with the whole system, the whole system understanding each other, that there's uh, teams that work together within the whole system. Uh, and there's different caretakers caretaking for different parts of the system. Integration is more about being that world-class baseball team. It's not about there's one star baseball player without the other team members. You wouldn't have a team that way. And um, clients who have survived by having different parts with different needs and different skills and different talents, they are attached to those parts. And integrating means building this close supportive relationship without necessarily having to cast off or let go of. They may choose to, they may choose just to slightly gently or out and out shift out, um, but that's not often what it means, integration for a client. It means we're getting along. And Bill, you may have some other ways to illuminate this even further. <laughs> The word integration is very, a very hot button in online DID communities. People have really strong opinions about it. So we have to be really careful using it in therapy because of what Reg tried to articulate that for many people, integration means um, blending, dissolving, merging, disappearing of parts or aspects of the self. So we prefer to use language like increasing integrative capacity. Um, and so inviting two parts who are aware from each other to experience a neutral stimuli is increasing integrative capacity. And it's also a back doorway to work towards reducing the phobia of dissociative parts for themselves. And our next chapter, we'll show you a pie chart or no, a bullseye chart, you corrected me, that um, has to do with those phobias. But this is a way of um, increasing that capacity so that people will figure out their own way of what integration means. So mm -hmm. we don't want to project it. Does that, did I go near what you were yeah, asking? I, I didn't know, I didn't know that integration is on the bad list of, of words that we are not allowed to use the way I look at it, the goal of every every therapy that works, whatever it's in the art, first of all, I'm looking at integration of the hemispheres, right? Right talks to the left better uh, as a result, but also adaptive resolution. What is adaptive re resolution in EMDR? That's an, a form of increased capacity. How do you say it? Increased capacity of increasing integrative capacity. Okay. Yeah. I agree. There's no good therapy without increasing integrative capacity. That's what we do in EMGR. We integrate. We but but it's just that the word in certain circles has become triggering. So sometimes we have to, you know, Be modify it. But we can't lose the concept of the broad concept of integration as that you know, knowledge of parts, communication among parts, um, the uh, cooperation and ideally compassion or empathy, just like Reg eludicated, enunciated, well, I can't find the word <laughs> earlier. Expanded upon. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So just real quick question, if it's okay. So during your um, demonstration, <laughs> Um, uh, was there a point to be able to help strengthen the experience of each other with some BLSs? Would that be something that you would include? You could, but remember, whenever you add BLS, you risk setting off a chain of associations. Okay. So in the... 
we were seeking to model an activity that the client could do outside of session, mm. but doing it in session to see how it goes and catching anything that goes wrong is safer, right? Right. So I wouldn't want a highly dissociative client to be doing something outside of session that involves BLS. So no, like I I would wanted to do it when she said she had that little tension between the adult and the seven Mm -hmm. about to chomp or not to chomp. Now, if I was processing the phobia between those parts, I would say, just notice that tension and follow my fingers. And I would do just a couple slow passes but I definitely wouldn't want her doing that at home. So I resisted every fiber of my being wanted to do that, but I didn't. Yeah. yeah. See, I have some self-control. People think I don't, but every now and then I do. <laughs> Can you do I, I hope you don't do BLS with your clients in the parking lot, Bill. <laughs> no, that I, don't. I haven't sunk to that level yet. I, but yeah. Across the parking lot. Just look at my finger. Look at my finger. <laughs> As I'm trotting away. <laughs> yeah. uh, no. But if you ever catch me doing that, put me on a plan, okay? <laughs> well, yeah. this is a core chapter in the book because the progressive approach is about gradually working our way to the traumatic material, gradually digesting peripheral elements of traumatic material, making connections, integrating. So the language of dissociative phobias is a wonderful way to help the therapist get a sense of where are we in treatment, okay? Because that's probably our biggest question so often with these difficult cases is where am I? That's like the first thing somebody asks in consultation is like, I've been working for this person for three years and I have no idea where I am. It's like, well, okay, sounds like a complex case. That's pretty normal. Um, So for Freud, phobias were about external things. For Pierre Genet, the originator of the theory of structural dissociation, the phobias are about avoidance of internal experience. And Mm -hmm. that's critical. That's what maintains dissociative processes. And they're like layers of an onion that we're going to peel back, not necessarily linearly. That would be like a too easy and perfect of a world. And this isn't that. Um, But keep in mind a core. Um, concept in the progressive approach is that we can use slow, short sets of bilateral stimulation in whatever modality um, for its de-arousal effect. Mm -hmm. When we're processing these peripheral elements, we normally don't want to do more than three sets in a sitting, unless it's someone we've done a lot of work with, And we don't want to do any more than four passes, which is normally installation of a resource thing. But if think about it in basic, you learned long, fast sets encourage information to move. So if information isn't moving, we do longer and faster. For um, our highly dissociative clients, it's like that adaptive information processing uh, Choo Choo is on a sliding board that's been sprayed with Pam. So we, if I start doing this, the client could go right out of the sliding board and out of the playground. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking less is more. Let's do one or two passes and see what happens. If nothing horrible happened, maybe I'll do one or two more, three, maybe four. And then maybe I'll even go up to a third set but then wait and see what happens during the week. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Okay, how does that sit with the system? And then you'll know if I did too much or just the right amount. Um, The the other thing, before I show you the pie chart, I just want to, a lot of you might be feeling frustrated because I think this is the second time in the book you've heard about the tip of the finger strategy. Mm -hmm. And... um, They keep giving you a little bit of instruction how to do it. So if it's frustrating you, page 231, a few chapters ahead, has the full instructions for tip of the finger. That's page 231. But, um, you know, write that on the inside of your book or something. But um, 
the processing of phobias uses the tip of the finger strategy in that we're keeping away from the core traumatic material mm-hmm. and which is up here, you know, we go down channels of association in EMDR. We're starting down here at the end of a channel with a peripheral element that relates to this, but this is too hot to handle right now. So we're not trying to wake that up. We're just trying to soften this little thing down here. Okay. Um, And my very, very favorite part of this book is the bullseye chart on page 142. And I'm going to put up on the screen um, my variation on it that I've created. Um, uh, I find helps explain these concepts. So if we think of the dissociative phobias as like an onion with all these layers. Now, they're kind of going to go in this order, but you're always going to be moving back and forth. But we have the attachment phobia related to the therapist, especially early in treatment. We're going to have to work out the relational things as we're building trust. There's always going to be relationship ruptures. We're dealing with people primarily with um, insecure, anxious, or generally disorganized attachment style. This is part of the treatment to move through the relational um, disruptions. And then the next phobia down that most often is going to emerge is phobia of trauma-derived mental actions. They didn't do a great job in the chapter of telling you what those are, so I'll tell you. (laughs) They're basically the action system, the defensive action systems of fight, flight, freeze, submit, and attachment cry, right? It can be other things too, but that, that's the core things. Remember the A and P by definition is phobic of these things, fight, flight, freeze, submit, and attachment cry. So we have to work on that phobia using the methods you know described in this chapter. A next likely one to come up is the phobia of dissociative parts, which we've been talking about. A and P's are phobic of EPs and all they contain. And remember, even A and P and EP, these are just hypothetical constructs for our shorthand, for our consultation, for knowing where we are. It's not going to be that neat with our actual clients, but it can help us conceptualize where we are. But the phobia of dissociative parts, we can process. And when we're doing these tip of the finger mini intervention We're just going for notice the emotions and the body sensations you're having and follow my fingers and we'll do slow, short set. Reg and I'll model this briefly for you in a moment um, with another phobia. Attachment phobia related to perpetrators. You know, um, I can't remember the name of the book. Somebody will feed it to me. You know, the one about the Miss America who um, is is diagnosed America by day, yes, I think that's it. She talks about um, this intra-psychic conflict about the dad who made her pancakes in the morning is also the dad that would come into her room at night. So it's not uncommon that we'll have one emotional part is completely devoted to a perpetrator. Another emotional part wants to kill them. And guess what? You have all kinds of intrapsychic conflict. Never mind where the apparently normal parts are with this. So these phobias have to be addressed um, as you're peeling back your layers. And then guess what? <laughs> the emotional parts are going to have their own attachment phobias to the therapist. So even though, as uh, Reg was saying, and as uh, Christine underscored, Normally, we're always trying to speak through the most adult self whenever possible, or at least in A&P whenever possible, but we still have to have relationship with the emotional parts. The whole self is in therapy. Mm-hmm. Now, Kathy Steele talks about um, drop-off child care. That's when the A&Ps want to drop the child parts off and we treat them, then they show up at the end of session to pay us and to um, drive home. We, we really want to do most of our work through the most adult self, but we still have to do some work directly with 
these um, parts and especially their relationship to us that the whole system understands that the whole system is our patient. Finally, finally, we get to the golden snitch, which is the trauma memories. And this whole system is organized around being, especially the apparently normal parts, being phobic of the trauma memories. And at those, we work through these other phobias and that was apparently normal part. Our parts are becoming more like that wise adult self that Reg is uh, preaching to us. We can then process start to process these core traumatic memories. And this isn't gonna be linear. We're gonna be going back and forth in it all the time, but I find it can be really helpful in just coming back to this page over and over again when you're lost. And um, unless you wanna ask us something else, maybe we could do a quick demo of dealing Absolutely. with the phobia of traumatic memories. Yeah, Would that be it. good? That would all be right. Excellent. So Bill, do you wanna set it up a little bit and tell them what they're gonna see? Yeah, sure. So what we're going to do is I've been working with Reg for months, if not years, and we have done a lot of work with tip of the finger, slow, short sets on the emotions and body sensations related to that entire onion that you just saw. So this is not our first couple weeks or months in therapy. And um, Reg told me at the last session that um, she's ready to take on one of the big childhood trauma memories. And, you know, we've done a lot of work. So now we're at the beginning of that session. And Reg, uh, last time we discussed possibly uh, doing some reprocessing of that thing that happened to you when you were seven, where, where are you with that right now? Mm -hmm. I, want, I want to do it. Okay. All right. Well, let's do some checking in before we dive into that. Would that be okay? Good idea. Yeah, good idea. Okay. So just check in with every corner of your mind and every part of your being. And as we consider possibly doing this work today, just notice any emotions, any body sensations, anything that comes to you right now. I am feeling anxious and my throat is getting smaller and tighter. Okay. Uh, it would be okay if we do a little experiment with that? You just, I'm your guinea pig. You're always experimenting on me and I'm always saying yes. Well, no, <laughs> but I'll say yes today. <laughs> okay. So, um, as you think about possibly doing that memory work today, just notice that sensation in your throat. Follow my fingers and just let happen whatever happens, okay? Okay. And take a breath. What are you getting now? Well, I can feel the open now. Initially, it was like closing from the top down. And then I was just feeling it open. And now I feel it open and my bones holding my head up. Okay. Just notice that. And take another breath and just check what's going on now. Yeah, I, I'm swallowing and breathing. Okay. Yeah. So then if we were going to continue, the next thing I would do would wash, rinse, repeat. I would have her do another check in and have her you know, just check in with every corner of her mind 
and every part of her being and notice anything that she's aware of as we consider doing this piece of memory work. And I would keep processing the phobia of the traumatic material that's emerging in this ever so subtle way until we get a clear mm. to go forward into the memory work. That is so important what you're highlighting, wash, rinse, and repeat. Because getting one shift in my throat was helpful, but there could have been other blocks and sensations in other parts of my body that I hadn't yet voiced. So it's really, um, it also allows me to feel cared about, all my parts to feel like they have permission to be noticed by me, my most adult self, to mm -hmm. notice and and uh, don't move forward unless we're all okay with it. I feel honored. Mm -hmm. Can I make a comment here? Yes. Please. Yeah. So this is, um, as you do this with your clients, they begin to gain trust that you're not gonna dive in and when one EP somewhere during the week says, well, what if, what if we bring up all these bad memories and we get dysregulated and go to the hospital again? And you get to the point where your client begins to trust you enough where they'll say, no, Christine would never do that to us. She goes very, very slow in that trust and rapport that our clients gain with us as we do this wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat. They're just like, come on, come on. But after a while, they begin to trust that we will take care of their system. We will be cautious with the traumatic material. Mm -hmm. That's and very well put, Christine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's modeling what Bill is doing with me, I can then do with my parts. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much for another demo. So we had two short demos and the, the recorded one, uh, Reg and Bill were kind enough to share with us. So we'll uh, drop it in our community, EMDR learning community platform. Um, Reg, you had a few announcements. Uh, I just want to be uh, mindful of our time. So Again, you're teaching this book in a 10 month program. Maybe you can, we can start with that, talking a little bit about this consultation program that you and Bill uh, do together. And then you have a few more announcements. Yeah, yeah. This will be our seventh round of doing the 10 month study. And it's gonna meet on Tuesday from 11 to one Eastern Standard Time, beginning February 7th. And it runs through November. Um, and then we're launching a new book study um, on treating trauma-related dissociation, a practical integrative oh, approach. Yeah. <laughs> and that one be, will be on Wednesdays from one to three, starting in March. It's going to be a little different, and it's open to non-EMDR therapists as well as EMDR therapists, because this current book study is just EMDR-oriented. Bill's also got a one-day program working with dissociation and complex trauma as an EMDR therapist, September 16th, 9 to 5.30. Um, Bill and I do uh, the training of RTEP, GTEP virtually. And we were the first two to launch the GTEP training in the United States, and we've been doing it. And the next we have, let's see, October, August and October, those are coming up. And if you're interested in the Imdria conference, um, I'm presenting with my co-author, co-editor, Safa Captain, um, on group EMDR. We're talking about all the group protocols and how to compare and contrast. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a second presentation uh, with a co-presenter, Terry Becker Fritz from Virginia on the nuts and bolts of organizing and sustaining a disaster response team. And then I'm on a panel for consultation and ethics. Um, let's see. That's all? Just, just working on a presentation <laughs> in the upcoming Andrea conference. Uh, yeah, Bill and I are trainers, and Bill runs the most amazing um, groups for CITs and certifieds. Anything else, Bill? 
And you can no, learn it's so much I'm exhausted. <laughs> you can learn about them at connectemdr.com. Yeah, and, and we will link under this video, wherever you're watching this video, if you're watching <coughs> it on YouTube or uh, on the Art and Science of EMDR, we'll have links to all these um, presentations and uh, events and trainings uh, below. Reg and Bill, I want to thank you so much for your time and dedication to, you know, teaching us EMDR. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being with you. Thank you. And you have an amazing community and it's beautiful the way you're supporting one another. This is a way to take care of yourselves and grow your capacity. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and thanks. We're so in such awe of what you've accomplished, bringing all these people together for the betterment of all. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Christine, for joining me today. Oh.